Hello, everyone. Welcome to our governance call number 14. My name is Orhan. I am one of the governance facilitators, and I am here to present a very exciting agenda today that I'm personally very excited about. And we have two main topics in today's call that we're going to cover. The first one is going to be the credit group, where you will get to see the members and ask your questions. And the credit group is going to play a key part in launching pools on Centrifuge Chain. And after that, we will be covering the three batched proposals that we have, which are three very big and important proposals that we just launched today that are up for vote. And we will cover those three towards the end of the call and also show you how to vote on them. Now, we usually start with a brief governance update and I usually talk a little bit about which proposals have passed, but the governance and coordination group started making an announcement on the forum, a post that I will link to here, where you'll be able to see all ongoing and past proposals since our last call. So instead of me sitting and mentioning all of those that you will have forgotten after two minutes, that's where you can go and see all of those. But I do, however, want to mention that the protocol fees proposal that we have talked about in recent governance calls passed. So just wanted to highlight that one. So that was a big proposal and also one that's going to be important for the future of the protocol. Now, and one other thing is that our governance documentation has been updated, uh, which is now live in the, in the docs. And it needed an update because we have changed our governance process and we've introduced some new user interfaces. So the screenshots and the explanations reflect those changes. So that's all I'm going to say, but uh, because someone else has something more interesting and very important to say. So Colin, if you're ready, I will pass it to you. Sure, thanks Oran. And uh, thanks everyone for being here. Um, I'm excited today to talk about the credit group with everyone. Um, I think the uh, I'll just kind of set up the flow of, of what we're going to discuss. And then it's there is no PowerPoint. Um, so as much as you can be on video and discuss and ask questions, that's kind of the focus of today's conversation as we are kind of publicly introducing the centric, uh, the credit group for really the first time, um, you know, through this through this community or governance call today. So um, you know, the flow will be, I'll hand it over to Mike Ruzik in a second, um, who's currently facilitating the credit group, and he'll kind of give us some background and history on the credit group and the original thinking. And I think the first post um, was in March of last year, when we really started first thinking about this as a community. Um, then I'll give some, some context around kind of how this works into the pool onboarding proposal and how we're thinking about that. Um, We'll let the, the credit group members, the current members, introduce themselves, and many of them are on this call today. Um, and then finally, um, some questions uh, that I want to direct to the credit group and to the community uh, for kind of open discussion and brainstorming as the credit group really starts to dig into their mandate um, and provide value to the community uh, in the centrifuge protocol. So, Mike Ruzik, I will hand it over to you. Um, just give us all a little context on the credit group and how we got here. Sure. Thanks, Colin. Hey, hey everybody. Um, yeah, it's good. I know for, for people who are regulars on this call, it's probably been, been a long journey with the credit group. I think we've been talking about it almost for, for, for a year now in, the, in these calls. So it's, so it's amazing to see finally, um, you know, the initial group come together. I think we, we collated a very strong group of professionals um, coming from the the credit space or the traditional credit space and I think their kind of venture and, and interest in web three is a is a good uh, validating data point really for what we're trying to do here. Um, so I think the the credit group was originally ideated uh, some time ago, I think, as a way to bring more professional credit expertise into the ecosystem and leverage those expertise to give us all as community members, um, greater insights into potential new pools. And I think that plays a key role um, in the POP, the onboarding process that Colin, uh, Colin spoke about. And I think the, 
um, insights and knowledge that uh, sector professionals are able to provide helps us get over the speed bump that it creates that, you know, not everybody interacts with credit instruments or credit analysis um, in their day to day lives and can use sector sector expertise to um, really make a more informed decision about what pools uh, we should be onboarding to the centrifuge protocol. So I think that's the overarching purpose. How we get there, um, I think, is an interesting road, and we've had some, you know, at least initial discussions between the group, which has been great in how we start um, start facilitating and start kind of providing those insights. I myself think it's going to be a, a kind of iterative process where we, you know, stepwise move towards or start moving towards um, scale and and you know reproducibility and digestibility from from all, all the members on this call and within the community and then hopefully broadly across the crypto space um we can become recognized as a leading light if you will uh in real world assets and credit on chain so i think that's the kind of broad vision like i said really happy at the group that came together it's quite a large group, and I think introductions will take a while. We have some questions after and, and time for a kind of more interactive discussion. So I'll, I'll cut it there. Um, say, you know, I guess I'll introduce myself first quickly for those who don't know me. Um, I was uh, part of the Centerfuge Protocol and still part of the DAO. Um, you know, helped in the original forming of the credit group post and put myself up as the first uh, leader, if you will, of the group, which really just means that I helped put together the group of people here and hopefully take us through the first several months of, of building and then, you know, hopefully hand that role off um, to someone uh, who's who's not only more experienced, but also can probably, uh, for, from a credit perspective, but can also probably, uh, you, you know, act as an independent actor uh, more clearly. And yeah, I have a background in traditional finance. I, I worked in investment banking and um, was at a hedge fund before I joined Centrifuge. Uh, that's me. I, I will pass it to, I will just call out a, a credit group member so we don't kind of go around awkwardly. And to my right, I, I see James Chan. So why don't, why don't you introduce yourself, James? Hi. <clears throat> Thanks, Mike. Uh, hi, my name is James Chan. I, <clears throat> excuse me, um, I'm a structured credit, structured finance, um, professional of over 20 plus years uh, across pretty much all structured credit, all structured finance, both on the buy and sell side, or, although mainly on the buy side. Uh, I'm currently at um, Seabury Capital, uh, which is uh, the principal investments arm, um, and also CEO of one of our portfolio companies, which is a working capital fintech. I was previously head of trade finance at uh, a large private credit fund. Thanks. Mike. Uh, I guess I, I see David next. Hi, my name is David Jang, CEO of a company called WinTech Industries. We're a supply chain management company. Um, we do about 650 million in supply chain assets on an annualized basis. Uh, this year it might be up to about 750 million. Um, I've been with this business about 16 years. Uh, we're deep within supply chain. Uh, in electronics, um, and uh, we've been working with Centrifuge for the last, I think, two and a half now years, um, helping try to bring real world assets on the chain. Nice to meet everyone. Who's next? I see Eric. Uh, Eric Mayo, Terra Incognita Capital. Uh, been lending to specialty finance lenders, people doing trade finance, factoring, other types of small business and consumer lending in the US and Latin America. Great, Sam? Hey everyone, I'm Sam Paderewski, the username Rue on the forum. Uh, I started my career at Citigroup's investment bank, uh, structuring and syndicating collateralized loan obligations and later moved to a hedge fund as an analyst and trader focusing on CLOs and uh, other structure credit, uh, TRUP CDOs, retrup CDOs, um, but we touch mostly everything. Uh, I worked as an analyst and trader there um, before moving to crypto full time last year. And so now I uh, contribute to MakerDAO's strategic finance team, as well as the Centrifuge Credit Group. Thanks, Sam. Um, who do I see next? Colin. 
Hey everyone, Colin Erickson here. Uh, tomorrow is officially my last day in TradFi. I've been working at a company called Victory Park for the past four years. Um, we do mostly asset-based lending um, in special situations. So kind of run across the cap structure, but with a focus on asset-based lending. Um, you know, about 50% of my time there was spent also looking at digital assets, including protocols like Centrifuge, um, and, you know, once you uh, take the pill, you can't unsee what you see. So uh, happy to be here. Nice. Um, I think that's all for the pictures. So excuse me if I miss somebody. I think Chris Diamond, actually. If you're here. Yep, I'm here. Um, okay. Hello, everyone. Chris Diamond. Um, yeah, I'm currently working at a, a single, single family rental stealth startup, um, then at startups around, I'd say, three years, focused on a variety of areas, sort of like strategic finance, capital markets. Um, and then prior to that, I was in uh, structured products, private equity at uh, Fortress Investment Group for many, many years, focused on uh, all sorts of different areas of real estate and structured products. And then prior to that, I was doing a very similar exercise at Hooligan, Loki, and in banking. So excited to be here. and. Um, work on the centrifuge uh, risk group. Nice. Have I have I missed anybody? Apologies if I missed somebody with picture off. Doesn't look like it. Okay, cool. I guess that's all all the interest. Cool. Thanks everybody. I'm excited you're all here. Um, some some different backgrounds than I think we've heard typically on centrifuge community calls over the years. So we're very excited to have you here. Um, you know, I have a couple of questions that I just kind of want to prompt to the community. And I think for the credit group, whoever feels whoever feels like these questions resonate the most, anybody can jump in with some thinking. Um, I think the context here is that as the credit group forms, you know, a first meeting I think was had about two weeks ago and kind of getting into the nitty gritty of how the credit group will operate and what the purpose of the credit group is, is still to be decided. Um, so a lot of that is still ongoing. This group is still forming it. Um, but I guess to Mike's point, we really do have the right people around the table um, and it's taken a while to get them all here. So um, I, I just wanna open up some questions that I'll put into the Zoom chat. And I'm just gonna bring up one now that I, I kind of prompted the team with yesterday, which was this question, which is, you know, what do you think the credit group should be doing um, specific to its role, right, and specific to its mandate? And then when you think about your experience in TradFi credit group members, um, what do you think it should be doing differently um, from the way that you've done things in TradFi? Or what do you think you'd like to see do differently as a, as a member of the credit group here at Centrifuge? So who feels compelled to take that first question as we open it up? Oh, what what do I start? Since <laughs> I started the intros, thanks, James. Um, <clears throat> so I don't think we should be doing anything different from uh, traditional underwriting in that it's there for a purpose, which is to underwrite the credit. So uh, regardless of how that's done, credit needs to be analysed properly. Um, I think probably for me, um, we can be a little more flexible in terms of how that process goes and what's relayed to the group um, and in what format and maintain that flexibility. I think traditionally it's very much a, um, you know, a, a, uh, a set way of decision-making and a set way of views. Um, sometimes it's right, sometimes it's wrong. <clears throat> a lot of the times it's not necessarily appropriate to the situation. Um, so I think as long as we can maintain the air of flexibility and willingness to um move with the situation then uh, i think that will be good progress james as long as it's not too long-winded as a, of a follow-up or takes you too far off course here can you just provide like a specific example of of where that flexibility has been lacking traditionally in tradfi yeah i mean we i'll try and give you a short answer on this one. <laughs> it's, no, it's, it's, a, it's a long discussion but um typically you find that within investment committees or credit committees, it's very biased towards specific um, uh, experiences and 
strategies and potentially agendas. Um, so, and people tend only to, to talk their book, as it were. Um, sometimes it works out, sometimes it doesn't. I've been in many situations where, um, you know, the hard rule of, of, of the land just was not appropriate uh, and actually even not even relevant to the particular credit situation. So I think um, as with everything, knowing your limitations is important. You know, if you don't know something and you can't contribute anything valuable to step aside with your view, that's something which I've, I've seen um, not to be present in most credit, credit committees. Great, thanks. Credit group members, any other thoughts to pile on there? Compliment what James has said. I can add something. Um, kind of building on the flexibility that was just described. I think since this credit group isn't in the business of allocating capital, we're free to kind of bring a, a diversified set of opinions as opposed to a necessarily unified view on any particular asset. So if there's you know, contradicting views within the group, we're free to present a majority opinion and, and describe how one group sees it and maybe a minority opinion and how a different group sees it. So we can kind of give a more well-rounded view of any particular issuer um, that typically is not, that option is not available to a traditional investment committee, which has to make a decision yes or no to apply capital to you know, whatever investments up for discussion. So we can kind of maintain that flexibility and give kind of a more well-rounded, more educational uh, view when, when creating our uh, underwriting reports. Rue, just a quick follow on there. Is that specific to your experience or maybe for you or other credit group members, when you think about credit committees or investment committees, um, is it typically a unanimous decision within a firm or is there dissent and is that expressed within you know, some of the shops that all you have worked at? I mean, I think in anything, there's going to be people that have their own views, but a lot of times what I've seen is that the more senior leaders of the credit committee, you, you, people are in the business of kind of predicting what they want to hear rather than actually saying what they believe to be true. So the way this is set up, I believe people will probably be more likely to speak their opinion and the consequences of having a differing opinion aren't as high because you're not actually allocating capital and not putting, you know, putting risk on the table personally. So you can kind of say, I think this is a good good investment, or I think this is a bad investment, and it doesn't you know, affect the operation of the group. Very helpful. Maybe a third and final opinion or thought on this question from any of the credit group members or community members who want to follow on with a, a question maybe in the same vein. Come on, got to be one. I can jump in here real quick. So I think that we're we're on something unique here, where we we have the luxury of being able to start from kind of ground the ground floor and essentially help create the new potential market structure. So we can take a lot of the biases out of the old prior structure. I think there's an opportunity to think about that, especially as it potentially looks at um, cross jurisdictional risk, which oftentimes most credit groups are very uh, singular jurisdictional domain. So I think there's some opportunity there to really think about it from a, a global perspective of what crypto can do. Um, in that way. David, for you, when you say cross-jurisdictional, I'm assuming you're talking um, jurisdiction, meaning like geography, but how do you think about the credit group and its mandate going, you know, cross asset class, um, you know, varying structures within the credit landscape? Can you maybe provide some more insight on that as well? Yeah, I think it goes back to James's point of, um, if you look at traditional credit groups, they're very domain on specific capability sets. And whether that's right or wrong, we could always debate that, but it really kind of, because they're anchored by a certain thought process and a certain uh, thought process and a historic context, they're anchored in that way of thinking and managing. And so we have the luxury of actually looking differently at this entire asset class to see is there a different way to manage risk. Really cool. There is a question from uh, Asad in the chat. Do you want to ask it uh, yourself, Asad? That's a first. That's a first. 
I can uh, I can read it out. <laughs> so it's probably uh, not able. But um, oh, is, oh, sorry, guys. There, there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Go ahead. Can you, can you hear me? Yeah, uh, apologies. Yes, we can. Now we can. Yeah. yeah. So um, I I wanted to ask a question that was a little bit spicy, but also something very near and dear to my heart that I think is like really relevant. You know, I work with a lot of DAO communities today. It's a big part of the centrifuge value prop of being able to interface with the DeFi ecosystem. You can see like MakerDAO, Sam, who's in that community, understands that really well. We work with them very closely. We're hoping to work with DAOs like Aave tomorrow very closely as well when they launch their stablecoin. And I think this will continue to be a theme in the market that we work in, these community-driven DAO-like entities being kind of significant stakeholders in our value chain. Uh, you know, I think it's incredibly challenging to work with them. I think it has a lot of like natural difficulties just being like, you know, we don't need to get into. I may be curious, an open question to ask the credit group, like, what do you think of when you think of these type of communities? We have to continue delivering value to them. I see a ton of value in the type of reports you guys will be doing. I'm just curious to maybe hear from the members themselves when they think about these stakeholders and these communities and how to deliver value to them, how to address their concerns. Hey, Asad, can I ask a clarifying question? So do you mean with respect to looking at investment opportunities or how the credit group is just going to relate to DAOs in, in general? Uh, you know, I don't know if Centrifuge will ever be the protocol that's helping, you know, investors at the end of the day make investment decisions. I think I knew all investors are going to have to do their own due diligence, but the credit group really is an entity that provides objective analysis, will ultimately be serving as an input into investment decisions, will ultimately be helping communities understand what we're doing here, really bring to light the complexities of credit. It's kind of the way I think about it. And so that's the where I'm approaching this question from, if that helps. Uh, I'll do my best. I mean, it's a complicated question. I mean, I think, um, you know, first and foremost, in theory, an investment committee is an unbiased group of individuals looking at, you know, a credit opportunity in our case. And, you know, dissenting, as Rue mentioned, um, oftentimes the people that are kind of the leadership of that organization have already dissented in private. And that just gets kind of rolled out across, you know, the group and the strategy and how capital is deployed. So, you know, I, I actually think that um, there's a certain kind of elegance to having a DAO framework nest a credit group where you can have a little bit more direct, um, I guess, you know, input. So I'm not saying anything dissimilar from Rue or, or James and David at this point. Um, and if you think then about, you know, from the opportunity set, like what it means to underwrite assets, like, and, you know, I don't want to kind of uh, put words in your mouth, but I, I think that, you know, quality assets can be underwritten for lending facilities in, in any respect and whether that asset represents a token or a consumer loan, um, you know, a Dow treasury token or a consumer loan, you know, those can um, reasonably be assumed to be assets. They just have different kind of risk profiles. And so whether or not, you know, Centrifuge's capital base is supportive of lending to, you know, Dow Treasury tokens or what have you, um, probably on the TBD. Um, and then I think the last point is just like what it means to work um, at an investment fund and interfacing with, with DAOs, just operationally speaking. And I, I think um, I've shared this publicly with the Centrifuge guys before. I think, you know, DAOs tend to be a challenging organizational structure because they're not necessarily set up to effectuate change or well they're set up to effectuate change but they're not set up to in kind of governance phase one set up to kind of um uh pursue a specific strategy with kind of the precision that a uh, traditional corporate structure can and i think you know dow modules and dow governance is evolving to hopefully kind of mirror some some functionality of tradition traditional corporations but that's admittedly a little bit on the come so um, there's a lot to unpack with what it means to like interface with a DAO, but I hope I did uh, did your questions some justice. Definitely, definitely did so. I'm, I'm curious to hear from the others, but yeah, that was, there's a lot to think about and unpack there, so I appreciate that call. Anyone else want to answer that question? I feel like community members or some of the other people on the call, maybe outside the credit group, could have some some thinking around how you know how you interact with or engage with DAOs, deliver value to DAOs, if you will. Any other thoughts? Not. There's another question from uh, Jake in the chat. 
You want to ask it the, yourself, Jake? Um, sure, sure, sure. How's it going, everyone? Uh, so my my question is really, um, is there like an existing framework that credit group plans to use or like a standard report or model? My understanding is that all these pools onboard different collateral. So my question really, is there a way you guys plan on standardizing the pools so that um, they can all be evaluated, you know, within the same kind of merit or structure or something like that? Just is there any standard way you guys plan on evaluating these pools through the credit group. Yeah, maybe I'll maybe I'll take that. Um, we have been work, we do have a working document as a group, which I think is is generic and broad and touches on some, let's say, important parameters that we can kind of measure. I think standardization in this process is is one of our the first things that we set out to achieve here and, and a reproducible process that you know makes it a lot easier for people to absorb this information use it and make it actionable um so i think that that is one of our main goals and something we're working on like i said we do have a template going around obviously there will be specifics for specific asset classes and we'll need to you know refine and and offer more granular information in some respects but hopefully we can come to uh you know uh, a high level template that we kind of um can use a standardization again maybe you know in the centrifuge community and what we're doing and maybe one day more broadly across the space it will be looked to as a as a template um for these kind of assets coming on chain maybe a a quick follow-on to that and then will i see you want to ask a question is it, maybe someone from the credit group uh, you know kind of looking at you eric mayo if we can get you to to chime in here a little bit is can you give us a, a sense of how standardized this is in, in TradFi versus, you know, is there, you know, is it change a lot from shop to shop, whether the credit community wanted structured one, one way versus another way on the investment community or the investment committee, meaning are all, all the credit group members coming in with a different view on what a standardized report could look like? Or do we think that most of the credit group probably has a view on, you know, what a report could look like? Eric, if you're open to it, love for you to give us some insight there i mean reports are always a little bit different uh you know to collins in some in james's points everybody's going to look at something a little bit uh differently depending on the asset class or um you know how the experience of the senior guys at the shop but there are you know basic documents everybody's going to need to have um so there's going to be some you know pretty what i would say you know, 70% of it is probably going to be standard across almost every asset class. And then you're going to get into, you know, for, you know, asset specific documentation that may be a little bit different, um, you know, running some of the numbers on or how you would look at a pool versus a single asset. So, you know, if you had a giant commercial building, versus a pool of trade finance loans that's when it's going to break out and you know look a little bit different um in in some of the standardization of the reports but i'd say you know most of you know sort of your single assets or most of your pools it'll be the same and then there'll be some some documentation specific to the asset great thanks for that eric um, if there's any other thoughts, jump in. If not, Will, would love for you to chime in with your question. Sure. Yeah, I think I'll go for it, Colin. Um, so I, I, I've got a decent amount of experience sitting in credit um, committees. I, I worked at a commercial real estate bank for a number of years. And what I've found is that um, the incentive structure really impacts the quality of the underwriting and the outcome of the underwriting. So like James, kind of what you were talking about earlier that the people tend to uh, sell their book. So whatever your incentives are, that really impacts how you underwrite a deal. So for example, uh, an old school bank, they're going to um, really not want to take a lot of risks. They're not going to want to invest into companies that are newer, that are smaller, because you know, they're a large bank, they have to protect their incentives uh, versus you know, the same someone who's made a ton of money, 
they're not going to take a risk lending to someone who is uh, newer because they, they're in to kind of protect your wealth versus if you're trying to grow your wealth, you're willing to take more risks. So your, your incentives really align or drive the quality and the outcome of the underwriting. So my, my question, and I, I don't know if, Colin, you may be the best person to try and answer, but I'm curious anyone else's thoughts of does the current centrifuge DAO structure along with the credit group, does it better align incentives than the traditional, uh, you know, TradFi? Or, in, and if it does, how so? I don't know. Is the is my response? Um, I think it's a complex question with a lot of yeah. a lot of bells and whistles. I'm not I'm not really I'm not really sure. I would say from a the original thinking right was that the, the way I've kind of thought about this at a personal level is that as centrifuge the community and the ecosystem continue to grow, we would continue to see more demand for assets to be financed through the protocol, and I think that has proved true in the time that I've been here. Um, and a lot of that is making its way out to the forum, as, as you know, well, well, um, I think what, what's been key in our thinking, at least as a community is that whatever, whether, how the incentives align, I think that's still a lot of work to be done and a lot to unpack there. Um, but I think just having the expertise and the experience, um, I've always found that to be something that we needed in the community. And this for me represents the first step. Um, how the incentives align, I actually think will be something that the, the community itself weighs in heavily as the credit group begins its work. It's a really good question, though. I agree with Kate. Yeah, thanks. And I appreciate the answer. Now, if anybody else has thoughts, please. But I think it's to be discovered as, as a community uh, on how we take this forward. I think, like... Just one one quick add here is that like there's a lot of assumptions around like what the process looks like, what the output of this whole journey looks like. And the, the reality is we're still like in the early stages of developing some of those frameworks, the materials that support, you know, our analysis, the actual end deliverable and, and its intent. Right. And so, you know, I um, and Corey had a question in the forum that I think we're on the meeting chat that kind of rings in line with yours, Will, I think. The reality is we're still figuring out how to make sure that the incentives are aligned, um, you know, correctly. But, you know, as with all of these things, it's a it's a walk before you can run and it's a little bit of a build it while you're driving it. Yeah, the um, what, what, what I found just in real time with our business is any way you can like uh, like if the credit group has skin in the game, um, like like a, you know, a, a bank's loan committee, their skin in the game is their job. <laughs> but if, if, if a percentage of their own personal capital is included in the loans being made, that really ties the incentives well. So if there's a, whether credit, the credit group or whoever's doing the underwriting has a percentage of the pool, um, whether that comes from CFG tokens or, or whatever, I, I don't know. I'm just like, if, if there, if, if I found that if the individual making the decision has skin in the game in terms of the money being lent out, um, that aligns the incentives really well. Um, but then you know they run you run into the same issue where they may not want to take as much risk. So I I, I don't know the answer. <laughs> so appreciate y'all. Yeah, I just I just want to add it's a it's a good question, but I just want to make the point that that skin in the game does align, but it also creates conflict. So it's, there's 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 many levels of questions that need to be answered um, around that particular governance and, and how things work and where the alignment should be. And one of those is whether skin in the game resolves that or whether it creates too much conflict. Cool. Um, so we'll say the, the incentive structure and all that stuff is to be decided, right, from an alignment um, perspective and how that works. I think we that's work to be done. 
um, and the credit group and the community being very transparent about that here. I think that's good. I mean, I think for, I think we'll, we'll, we'll close it up here with kind of a final question. I'd like all the credit group members just to kind of give an answer here, which is, I think, you know, we've talked about the credit group. We've talked a little bit about the industry, some incentive structures, flexibility, um, not talking your own book, you know, the, the people who actually know the asset, being able to express an opinion, people being able to express different opinions um, around assets, around credits. Uh, I think it's really exciting that this type of flexibility is going to be there. Um, but away from like the credit group's work or your experience in TradFi, you know, maybe at a personal level, I think it'd be good for the community just to hear from the credit group members. When you think about this work, being on a call like this, um, joining this community, um, and, and participating here, um, I think it'd be good to hear from just from each of you at a personal level, what, what kind of motivates you to be a part of this credit group um, with the understanding. And I think Colin Erickson said it well, right? Like we're at the very, very early, early stages of this type of work. Um, so much so that we're still <laughs> ideating um, kind of the purpose and the go forward plan of the work and the execution the credit group will actually do. Um, and so it means a lot that you are doing this, but I think at a personal level, it'd be great to hear uh, why each of you are here to the degree you're comfortable sharing. So if we can do that, that'd be great. And then if other questions pop up, we can we can take those. So uh, David Chang, you're set. You're sitting right next to me, so I'll let you kick off. Yeah, that's a good question. So for me, you know, I look at the world as kind of like three major phases: pioneering, settling, and city planning. When we think about development of ecosystems, I think what we're doing here is really around pioneering new ecosystems. Um, and so for me, that's that's really exciting to actually uh, be interacting and working with um, essentially what I think is going to be leaders of the new ecosystem. And so number one, learning from the rest of the group um, and then just working collaboratively to build out a new ecosystem gets me really excited. So that's that's why I'm here. I'm look, really hoping to uh, help build out the community and, and make this world a lot easier for real world assets. Thank you, Eric. You're next to David. I'll let you go next. Yeah, no, I mean, I think, you know, for me, it's having done a, a lot of work overseas and, and and seeing the need for capital there. And I think being able to apply um, some of the technology and the solutions that would tie in well with, you know, systems that are developed overseas and, you know, admittedly take out some of those middle office jobs and, and costs um and and seeing everything go that way just excited to be at the forefront of the development of that thanks eric rue you're up next sure um you know i think about centrifuge and why it's exciting it's it's kind of the same reason that i you know wanted to leave my traditional finance job and and do crypto work full time um yeah this definitely feels like the cutting edge it feels like there's I certainly from my seat in structured finance, where there's a lot of intermediaries, toll takers, you know, administrative work, legal costs and opaqueness. It's so easy to see all the efficiencies that can be created with something like blockchain technology. So for me, um, it was a no brainer to kind of move my career in this direction and see how I could, you know, use my expertise that I've built in traditional finance and try to apply it to a, a new framework and a better system and, you know, centrifuge and, and my involvement with Maker, these these organizations are at you know the ground floor and are really large players um, and trying to build this new system. So um, you know I just want to find a way to be a part of it in, in any way I can and try to make everything work a little bit better. Awesome. Glad you're here. Colin Erickson, you're up. Um I kind of just like have two assumptions broadly. I just think that, you know, there's going to be more tokenized assets tomorrow than there are today. And if you see any convergence of kind of the tokenized asset representation with traditional, you know, public bond markets, um, we're just going to like handicap round, round the numbers out to 500 million uh, all the way through in the public debt market, you know, 150 trillion ish, like, you know, there's just immense opportunity for the people that are developing the infrastructure. Um, you know, I didn't mention this up front, but I'm working with a few different projects that attach to the ecosystem at, at various points. And so just trying to be, as in, you know, involved with, um, you know, this process of, of bringing legitimacy to what we're building here. Thank you, James Chan. Um, 
it's it's really simple for me uh it's it's a bit of progression and advancement um you know i i think throughout my entire career i've always tried to to learn where i can um it's the most interesting part of the job um and then at the very least it, i think it'll be fun i mean i've put in my time doing a lot of traditional finance and um if i can help uh move things along in a in a way that's fun and engaging for everyone else and myself why not i mean there's no real downsides to it awesome uh chris diamond i think you're off video but if you're there i'm here i'm here um a lot of a lot of reasons uh to have joined up but uh you know sort of in line with a lot of what others have said um essentially same i guess reason i left uh, tried to find to do uh, fintech and prop tech startups about four or five years ago now. Um, you know, I was at a traditional finance, you know, Fortress Investment Group, um, and a lot of the ways that you know uh, they were thinking about things at the time, you know, were not. Um, you know, it was like some of the stuff we talked about on this call, like stuff we've always done it X Y Z way, and it's always worked. Um, so we're going to do it that way. Uh, obviously not really how the world has evolved in the last like 10 to 15 or more years. So, uh, you know, always looking to help be part of evolution. And obviously with a lot of um, structured products background and sort of that TradFi, you know, I think uh, cryptocurrency, blockchain technology is all sort of, even though it's been around for, for quite some time now, it's still in its infancy and, and we're trying to build, you know, something that can replace those traditional finance um, sort of behemoths that do block out, you know, some of the smaller players that need liquidity. And, and um, you know, I, I think one of the questions here is like, how do we make sure that we're sort of underwriting to a, you know, a legitimate standard and making sure that everybody sort of has a fair shake to gain access to this um, funding and liquidity. And that's very meaningful for me. You know, one of the places, one of the startups I went to um, was a company that many of you probably know, like Better Mortgage or Better.com. Um, and the focus was, you know, digitizing home ownership or trying to make, you know, a one-click mortgage. So um, being able to lend faster and provide more liquidity while um, sort of compliant and governance is very important. And I think um, that this is just one of the ways uh, in which I can help push that initiative. Awesome. Uh, Mike Ruzik, we'll give you the last, the last comment, and then we'll hand it back to you, Orhan, to continue the last 15 minutes. Cool. Yeah. Thanks. Thanks everyone for those very insightful. And I think I echo a lot of those. I think for me, really what got me excited here and more broadly about what Centrifuge is doing and a lot of the other protocols in this space that I'm sure people on this call interact with is there's just a lot of white space. It's still very nascent. It gives us a chance. You know, I, when I was in traditional finance, I was a piece of piece of the machine, you know, late to the party. There was people before me that really pioneered stuff. And I think with this opportunity, um, I felt the ability to be at the forefront and pioneer something new, which I think has been something interesting to me and something I wanted to do in my career. So happy to drive this, happy to iterate, happy to figure out from ground up. And I think that's a cool place to be. Great. Thanks, everybody. Really appreciate the time. Thanks to the credit group members and everyone being here. Or help. Thank you, Colin, and thank you, everyone in the credit group for presenting your views and introducing yourselves. I'm sure we're going to see more of you and your work on the forum when new pools are going to be launched. Now, for the last part, there are, um, I want to talk very briefly about three proposals that we have batched and that are open for a vote on Open Square. I'll be talking very briefly about two of them, and then I'll pass it to Yaron to talk about the third one. So the first proposal is the founding documents of the Centrifuge DAO, which we have discussed and talked about in recent governance calls. So that's one of the proposals that is up for a vote. The second one is the POP process, the pool onboarding process, a new proposal for how to improve the version we are using today. And the last proposal is the mandate for the protocol engineering group, also roadmap proposals. And I will pass it to you, Yaron, to talk a little bit about what that is about. 
Yeah, thanks, Oran. Um, I'll keep it very short. Um, basically, like I think similar to uh, in many ways to the credit group, where we're trying to like decentralize and make transparent uh, like credit underwriting in the DAO. Um, we also want to decentralize more of the, the engineering and product work in the DAO. Uh, and currently, like it's a relatively small group of people that are um, actively building on the Centrifuge protocol. Um, but we're, I think, working very hard and, and always trying to um, open it up more because uh, ultimately, um, I mean, back to the earlier point about $115 billion or trillion dollar bond market um, that's not going to be re uh, replaced by a single um, group. Like we need a decentralized community also building that product. Um, and so the protocol engineering group, as well as the like roadmap process uh, proposal is uh, a step in that direction. Um, and it kind of has two uh, objectives as part of this mandate. Um, one, um, to kind of publicly and openly um, share technical feedback on public proposals. Um, I think it's uh, the goal that more and more kind of new protocol features are being discussed in the Centrifuge community. Um, but obviously, it's really important that um, the work that's being proposed and the work is being accepted by, by um, token holders is kind of taking into account what is technically feasible and what technically makes sense. Um, and the practical reality is, is that today it's a, a small group of people that has the kind of technical expertise to to um, figure that out. Um, and really, so we're just trying to um, open that up and, and have those discussions uh, in the forum. Um, the other part of the um, mandate is to propose a, a roadmap proposal process um, with the goal basically being to um, look at the various like new feature proposals uh, in, that have already been improved um, and sort of try to um, prioritize them based on what technically makes sense. Very often, like some features are required to be, to be built for other features, um, as well as um, uh, many other factors. Um, and so the yeah part of the goal to, and the mandate here is to um, kind of act as almost more like a facilitator here. And the goal very much is that uh, the DAO is voting on what the roadmap should be for the DAO and to align as the direction there, but for the product engineering group to um, uh, get our inputs and, and propose roadmaps. Um, yeah. um, it was published like a week or so ago on the forum. It's on the voting stage now. Um, if there are any questions, happy to um, talk about it. Thank you very much, Yon. Are there um, any questions? We have a couple of minutes. So, so if anyone has anything they want to ask, or they want clarified any further, please do ask. Question, the, the proposals are open for how long? 14 days. I will go and uh, talk about that like in a, in a couple of minutes, but 14 days, they're gonna be uh, be open. Yeah. But yeah, I personally think it makes a whole lot of sense to have a protocol engineering group to as an addition to our DAO that we are in the process of, of building, like in addition to the credit group and governance coordination group, we will now also have a protocol engineering group to assess the technical aspects of the proposals made that normal community members are not able to to do. So, but when you said that um, you want that you will assess some of previously passed proposals, that means like something like the protocol fees and the block rewards that have already passed, that you will provide a technical feedback on those, right? Yeah, I think um, yeah. No, the goal is that um, if the group is accepted, of course, uh, in the next two months, uh, we would. Um, the group would propose a first roadmap, um, including all the kind of unimplemented but um, accepted features like those. Yeah, exactly. Right. Any additional questions or comments to this? Otherwise, feel free to ask them in the, in the forum post. Likewise, if someone had questions to the credit group they didn't get their answers to, feel free to do it in the forum post where the credit group is introduced as well. All right. Then um, I'm going to move on to the last part of the agenda, which is how to vote on these three proposals. 
Now, all these three proposals were started today, this morning, Europe time, and they will be running for 14 days. The vote is going to be open for 14 days for all three proposals. And it takes place on open square, which means it's actually off chain. In other words, you are not actually locking up tokens or paying any transaction fees to vote on these proposals. You do need to have CFG tokens in your wallet in order to vote on them, but nothing else is, nothing is locked or anything. So I'm gonna show you just how easy it is to vote on these proposals. So let me just find it here and share my screen. All right, can you guys see my screen now? Yes. All right, thank you. So what you do is you navigate to opensquare.io. We will always provide the direct links in our announcement so you can click on them and go directly to the proposal to vote on. But if you go to opensquare.io, let me just go back, you're gonna see this page here. Then you go to centrifuge and you can see all the proposals that are open. And these are the three that we just talked about. And they're all three active. So what you need to do is connect your wallet. If you have more wallets, you can press the arrow here and select the right one. And usually you have to type in your password for that account, but I had already logged in earlier, so I didn't have to do it, but you type in your password and then you go to each of these three. I'm just gonna show you for one of them because it's the same that has to be done for all three. So you click on the proposal you want to vote on. You will always provide a very short description of it and with links to the full proposals. And then there are two options, yes or no to this proposal. So you click, I'm choosing to vote yes here. So I'll click yes, vote, sign the transaction, vote registered, done. That's all. So you can do the same thing for the other two. Find the proposal, select your vote, click vote, sign the transaction, and it's registered. So that's all you need to do. And we, I want to encourage all CFG token holders to use their tokens to vote on these proposals. So they're open for 14 days, so there should be plenty of time to do it. Any questions regarding these three proposals or how to vote on Open Square? in these snap, 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 snapshot votes. It's getting late. All right. Well, good to hear then. So then there is um, one last thing that I always tend to forget. So I'm going to do it before I forget. And that is that every person attending this call can claim a PO app. And I don't know that you have to go to our Discord channel and type in a command there. Ivan, do you have uh, the command for this month's PO app? Yep, Ivan just posted it in the chat. So you can go to the Discord channel, type in that command and just follow the instructions to claim your PO app for this particular governance call. Um, all right, we still have a couple of minutes. Uh, there's a question for uh, you actually, uh, Yaron here, if you don't mind, if you're still here. Um, and that is from one of our community members which is, do you plan to publish a performance report every two months or every quarter or six months? Uh, 
I think he's left the call, actually. I was too slow. Story yeah. of my life. Sorry about <laughs> that. We can ask him on the forum. And otherwise, we can just, unless there's any other questions, we can right. end early. So any other closing thoughts, questions, or anything before we call it a day, afternoon, night, wherever you are? I just want to shout out to um, all of the credit group members that came on the call today. It was really great hearing about your experience. Um, and I'm, we're really looking forward to learning more from you and hope, hope that you'll be regular attendees of this call. So thank you. And thanks to Colin and Mike as well. Great questions. Got a lot of work to do. Um, it was exciting to have the introduction and to have so many people here. So thanks for all the engagement. Really appreciate it. Yes, great to see everyone as usual. Looking forward to see you in our next call next month, same place, same time. Take care. See you folks. Bye. Bye. Thanks, Rohan. Great work.